Okay, here we go. So what did we do last time? Uh, we talked a bunch about LQR things, right? So we did kind of the um, uh, LQR is a QP story. We did, um, and then we kind of, we did this Riccati recursion thing where we looked inside the QP at the sparsity structure and kind of figured out this back substitution trick where you could kind of start at the bottom of the matrix and solve some things and plug them in and work your way up to get a solution. Um, and we saw that that ends up not only being a super efficient way to solve the QP, but also giving you, uh, gives you a feedback controller, right? In the form of these K matrices, uh, which is pretty cool. Then we played around with that a little bit, right? And did some simulations, that was most of it. Um, okay, so today we got a whole bunch of things on the to-do list. So the first thing I wanna do is sort of some little loose ends on the LQR story. Um, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, control of, so first thing I wanna talk about is that we talked to, uh, briefly last time about the infinite horizon case. Um, say a few things about that. And then um, there were a bunch of questions also last time about uh, kind of how do you know if that QP has a solution, right? How do you know if LQR is going to work? So we're gonna talk about the last little piece of that today, which is called, um, controllability, which is kind of a fun result. Um, and then we're gonna get into uh, dynamic programming and sort of another, yet another way to look at LQR, but also a way that kind of generalizes in a bunch of interesting directions. And we'll see how far that takes us. That might be the end of today, but if, if we have some time, we might get into starting to talk about uh, convexity and convex MPC and things like that. Okay, any questions about anything from last time or all good? All right, so let's, let's do some stuff. So the first thing I wanna talk about is briefly at the end of last time, we talked about this infinite horizon idea. And um, we kind of saw empirically that at least for the time invariant case, when you run that backward recursion, the game matrices converge pretty rapidly to some asymptotic values, right? And we said, you know, in the limit as you go up to infinity, there's this kind of steady state. And a lot of times we just use that, right? So for time invariant LQR, um, K matrices converge to constant. And um, we said for, for stabilization problems where you just wanna keep the system at a fixed point, we usually just use those constant K matrices. Okay, so a couple of interesting little things about this. First one is, um, so we already saw you can kind of run the Riccati equation backwards for a while and it'll converge. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on how we might solve that like in a more direct way for the sort of, just to get that infinite horizon value based on some things we maybe talked about earlier around like, fixed point iteration, solving for fixed points, et cetera, et cetera. What does that sound like? Okay, so let me uh, be a little more explicit then. So the let's write down the backward recursion for P that we had before. We had um, PK equals Q plus blah, 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 A transpose PK plus one, A minus B, K, right? And just think about this for a sec. We had this, I guess we had, we had the two things, right? So when this thing converges, what's gonna be true about these P's and K's? They're not changing anymore, right? 
So I can basically set PK equal to PK plus one and get a, a, a fixed point, right? That whole thing will equal zero. And I can solve that directly to get the infinite horizon gains. Uh, let me write these both down. Okay, so and you can plug the k equation into the p equation and get like a single equation in p. Right? That's sort of the, the if you want trick. So um, you can kind of just solve that directly as like a refining problem. There's, uh, so the obvious way to do that would be, so we have this fixed point iteration thing. What other methods do we know how to do this with? Sort of obviously Newton's method, right? So we could just stack this up, solve it as a refining problem with Newton. That would get us the answer really fast. So that's a perfectly reasonable way to go. Um, turns out there's some special secret sauce, fancy linear algebra tricks for solving this equation as well. Um, and uh, you can do that too, and that's kind of maybe more efficient and numerically better. And that's what um, the uh, functions in MATLAB and Julia do for you. So in particular, um, in MATLAB, uh, we have this uh, function called dare. Uh, dare will give you the p matrix, the p infinity, um, and then DLQR, which we already saw, will give you the infinite horizon k, and those are in both Julia and MATLAB. So they're doing fancier things, but you can absolutely use fixed point iteration or Newton's method to solve these as a root finding problem. Okay, any questions about that? We kind of saw that last time. Cool. All right, so um, the last little like LQR thing we're going to talk about is controllability. And this is really getting at the heart of like, when will this work? When will it converge? When it will it stabilize the system? Like, when can you apply LQR? Has anyone heard of this before or seen this before? A handful of you guys. Okay, cool. So um, basically, so we already know, you know, this condition on the definiteness of the cost matrices, right? We have to pick Qs and Rs that are essentially positive semi-definite in the Q case, positive definite in the R case. So that's stuff we make up though, right? That's just telling us we have to pick nice-ish cost functions. Um, there's some conditions on the system itself as well, on the dynamics, right? On the physics that tell us whether or not we can actually do this feasibly. Um, so let's look at that. Uh, um, so in particularly, we're going to look at the time invariant case again, just because the math's easier. There's a very similar, close, super closely related result for the time variant case. Um, but this one has a really nice, clean, you know, intuitive flavor. So look at this. Hmm? Uh, what the hell? Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Okay, so blah, 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 time invariant case. Um, there's, there's a nice simple answer. Okay, so here's how we're gonna think about this. So if I 
I'm going to look at the sort of the QP flavored thing, but we're going to look at it as a like basically as a shooting problem where we're just optimizing over the use um, and think about um, what the kind of the setup of the problem looks like. So think about the dynamics here for any initial state x naught. Uh, if I look you know forward in the future to x n. I can write that down as um, so, like obviously, x n equals you know a x n minus one plus b x n minus one um, equals. So I can kind of recursively keep plugging in the linear dynamics here, right? So I can write this as you know x n minus one is a x n minus two plus b u n minus two, right? And I can keep plugging in the dynamics for all the X's recursively. And sort of obviously, if I keep doing that, you're gonna get something that looks like A to the N X naught. Uh, this should be capital N, right? Uh, plus A to the N minus one B U naught plus blah, 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 blah. Like A to the lower powers, yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, wait a sec. No, that's B U naught. So um, that's sort of like the very tail of the recursion, right? But, but is it BX? Like, is, like in the first line, the multiplying BX, BX, so it should be B. Oh, yeah, that's sorry. Yeah, you guys are right. My bad. This should be a U, obviously. That's just the top line again. Okay, sorry about that. So yeah, essentially what you're gonna do is start at the end and just keep like recursively plugging in the dynamics till you get to the first time step. If I kind of keep doing that and expand it out, I'm gonna get this situation where I have like, you know, X naught is multiplied by A to the N to get to time step N and successively sort of like each, each successive power of A, right? Times like B times the U from that time step, right? Sort of, you get the idea. That clear for everybody? Cool. So if I do this, now I can like look at this and I've I've essentially just got the X naught in there and then everything else is just the U's, right? So I've kind of written this in like kind of shooting form if you like, or sometimes it's called condensed form where I've eliminated all the states and written it is just uh, in terms of the initial state and then all the U's, right? We said this isn't generally the way to go numerically because it gets ill-conditioned. Does anyone know why this gets ill-conditioned? It's sort of obvious from here. So, huh? Yeah, so whatever the condition number of A is, A to the N is gonna be that condition number to the N. So the condition number gets worse and worse as you take more time steps. So this is why it's a bad idea numerically. Um, so don't do this for real uh, in the computer, but here's some nice math. So if I take this thing I just wrote down, I can then, um, I can kind of write this in matrix form as the following thing, B, A, B, a squared B dot 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 A to the N minus one B times all the U's. So like U uh, N minus one, U N minus two, dot 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 U naught plus the uh, the initial state term. So A to the N X naught. Is that cool? Okay, so we're going to, this is, um, we're gonna call this thing out front, the controllability matrix. And the idea here is in order for me to drive, so remember the goal of the LQR problem is to drive the states to the origin, right? From any initial condition, right? So what has to be true about the controllability matrix for me to solve this problem for any X naught? So yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, does anyone, does this problem look familiar to anyone? Like what kind of problem is this as like a linear algebra problem? What happens when you have like, I don't know, a big tall skinny matrix, you know, kind of linear system problem or a big fat matrix? Uh, you know, non-square linear system to solve. What do you do? 
Yeah, but what's what's that called? The solution to that problem when you can't find the exact solution, you find out what? Pseudo yeah, the pseudo inverse is how you compute it, but what is that called? It's called a least squares problem, right? So this is a least squares problem. Um, okay, cool. So let's write this down. Um, Um, where we want to solve for the controls, right? For you, uh, what is it? U uh, not to n minus one. So what we would do, right? We we'd stack. We get our u's that we want to solve for, and we can write this as, like everyone said, right? We end up with this pseudo inverse thing that sounds like everyone's seen before. So I'll just write this down. Okay, so this thing is called a pseudo inverse right up here. Who has not seen this like pseudo inverse least squares trick before? Okay, uh, come talk to me after. <laughs> I'll show you. you can also Wikipedia it, it's pretty straightforward. Essentially, the idea is I have a non square thing. I multiply both sides by like C transpose and I get a square matrix that's invertible, right? That's kind of the trick that makes it work, but there's sort of, there's some other stuff going on there. So we can talk about that. Okay, so that's the pseudo inverse thing. The condition on this being solvable, right? Is the C transpose, C, C transpose thing over here um, must be invertible, right? Okay, and for that to be true, it comes back to like the rank of that C matrix has to be uh, N where N is the state dimension. So it has to have like full uh, column rank. Okay. Um, we have to, right, for this thing to be invertible, we have to have um, rank of C equal to N, where this is little n, not the big N number of time steps N. This is um, N equals dimension of the state. Does that make sense to everybody? When I so like square the C matrix, it's going to turn into a square matrix that's little n by little n, and that thing needs to be uh, full rank to be invertible. For that to be true, the, the C itself, the big fat C, has to be rank n. Cool? Okay, so that's kind of the basic. Is that clear to everybody? So yeah, in order for this problem to have a solution, you have to have this controllability matrix thing be full rank. Um, there's a one more little interesting trick here. So I wrote this out for arbitrary horizon, right? Like big N time steps. It turns out you don't have to do that. You get to stop at little N. Does anyone know why? Yeah. Because the rank is always the lesser of the two dimensions. Well, so even if arbitrary time steps is capital N, the rank, the number of independent columns will still be equal to small. So like you can't make the rank any bigger. That's true. Yeah. So but the information you need is in the first small end rows. So, so small end not rows. it doesn't have to be that. Yeah. Isn't it because you can rewrite it using the scaling? You got it. Okay. Yeah. So you're kind of, I mean, what you're saying is true, but that's not at the end of the day. Like the controllability matrix is still, you know, it doesn't have to be the first n columns, right? It, it's still wide. I mean, there could be the first n columns might still be rank deficient. So you, you may still need to go further, but the, the, the answer is um, so this thing called the Cayley Hamilton theorem, which who's heard of this? Okay. Does anyone want to say what it is? Okay. So that is a, that's sort of a corollary and, and absolutely true. There's sort of an important sort of like 
corollary thing to that that is why we can do this. Do you, does anyone know what that is? Power of the matrix. Power of the matrix is power of the eigenvalues. Uh, well, you can always do that by by computing an eigen decomposition, blah blah blah. But there's sort of like a specific result that I'm gonna. Oh, if anyone knows where I'm going with this, say it. But otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll write it out. Wait, can you hear me? Yep. This is where you can just say that any matrix or any power of a matrix beyond its dimension can be written as a linear combination of its lower powers. You got it. That's why. Okay, so I'm going to say that louder for everyone else. Okay, so the Cayley Hamilton theorem thing says a matrix satisfies. That's absolutely true. This is sort of the main reason that we care. It says that for any matrix, uh, any higher power than n for n by n matrix, uh, you can always express as a linear combination of the lower powers. So basically, after you get past little n, you're not getting anything new. Like you can always write that as a linear combination of, of powers up to n. Does that make sense? So let me write this down and we can talk about it. So in particular, it says a to the n equals sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of like alpha k a to the k uh, for some alpha k's, where those are scalars, right? So those are polynomial coefficients, right? OK, um, so this is saying basically for any power you know, n and bigger, I can write it in terms of lower powers. So I'm not getting anything new. So in this controllability matrix, it's saying we're checking rank, which is like linear independence of the columns, right? So this is telling us is if I take higher powers past n minus one, it's not getting me any new linearly independent stuff, right? Okay, awesome. Okay, that's so that's the controllability match. So at the end, the, the end story here is we're going to define this as um, this this controllability thing for us is always going to be basically B A B dot 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 A to the N minus one B and you have to stop there and then you check that things rank if it's full rank, then that says LQR will be able to stabilize the system. Um, and like Riccati will converge and all that other good stuff. All right. Cool. Any questions about anything there? We're going to take a hard pivot now towards some new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I got a question about LQR in general. Yeah. Sorry, there's someone in the, we'll do the room first and then the Zoom. Go ahead. Uh, it's saying that what this says is, yeah, if you, with n time steps, you can drive any point to the origin, assuming you have like infinite control effort available and whatever else. Yeah, this is also saying that. Yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, who's on Zoom? Someone had a question? Yeah, so um, I know uh, back when we were first going over LQR, we had the dynamics matrices sort of function as a constraint. Yep. Um, but you also mentioned that there are, you know, sometimes like torque constraints. Yeah. Um, and where do those fit in in the sort of LQR problem formulation? They do not. <laughs> so, oh, okay. we haven't yet. so LQR is explicitly this one little like result where you have linear dynamics, quadratic costs, and nothing else. 
if you mm. add any kind of constraints uh, to the states or the controls, it breaks. Uh, if you add any nonlinearity, it breaks. If you add different cost terms, it breaks. So this is like this very special little result. And really, if you change anything else about the problem setup, it breaks this closed form solution. Turns out in the case of linear dynamics, quadratic costs, but you just add in torque limits, say like U bounds on U, that's still pretty tractable. Um, but the way to solve that is with model predictive control, which we're gonna get into in a little bit actually. So uh, hold on to that. Um, it turns out you can do a lot of similar analysis, but the, it gets a lot more complicated. Uh, but yeah, that, those problems are also tractable. And that's the answer is MPC is what you want in that case. Okay. Cool. All right. Moving on then. Anybody have anything else? All right. So next up, we're going to talk about, uh, start talking about dynamic programming. Uh, so who's seen this stuff before? Probably a lot of you guys. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to start out by talking about this idea called Bellman's principle. Okay, so the big idea here is that um, we've talked a whole bunch about like optimal control problems having a lot of structure. We saw that already in the in the matrix, right? In the QP, it's got this really nice like band structure, all this sparsity. And that was like one way of getting to the Riccati equation. That matrix band structure is a direct result of this sort of like underlying structure. You can call it Markov structure if you like, whatever. But um, it's really this idea that the problem is uh, sequential in time. And here, um, we're going to sort of see that in another way. And sort of the intuitive, like, way of thinking about this is just that um, past, it's like the, you know, just like uh, causality, right? So like past control inputs can affect future control, future states, but future control inputs cannot affect past states, right? It's just that simple. That is really the, at the root of it, that's where all this comes from. So this is like a seemingly very obvious fact, but it has like a fancy name attached to it and a whole bunch of theory attached to it. Um, okay, so the, the thing we're gonna formalize that idea with is this thing called Bellman's principle or the principle of optimality. Uh, this is all called, oh yeah, Bellman's principle or the principle of optimality. Um, this is just like a very fancy sounding name. It's like very grand sounding, right? The principle of optimality. Um, Okay, so here's the idea. So a, a like obvious kind of corollary to that fact of, of like kind of the causality thing with time is if I have some trajectory, you know, T, X, whatever, draw something, doesn't matter, squiggly line. So this is like X naught over here. We've got some knot points in our trajectory where we're making control decisions, say, and we end up at like X goal over here. Um, what it's saying is, so if, let's assume this thing's optimal with respect to whatever cost function I wrote down or whatever. If I were to write down a new optimal control problem that started somewhere else along this trajectory, like say I gave you a new point uh, right here and uh, like this XK, if I started at that spot, which is on this optimal trajectory, and gave you a new optimal control problem with the same cost, same goal, 
uh, but starting from that other point, it says that that sub trajectory has to be the same as this one, as, as from the bigger trajectory. Said another way, it says that like any sub trajectory of an optimal trajectory must also be optimal for the simple and obvious reason that if it wasn't, like if let's say if I resolve this problem starting from this XK, like if, if I say found some other path that was optimal, you know, that went this way, I would have taken that a lot on the bigger trajectory, right? So if we're saying like, let's, let's think about it as time layer, shortest path or something. If there was a shorter path starting from that midpoint XK to the goal, that would have been the optimal thing to do starting from X naught, right? On the bigger trajectory. That makes sense to everybody? It's sort of obvious, but it, you know, I don't know. It has deep implications. Yep. So if you had a problem where, so suppose now you have six points in between the start and the goal. So suppose the problem was that you had to pass through only three of them. Then this will sort of break if you started at a different point. Yeah, but that's sort of not a, that sort of doesn't fit into the standard trajectory optimization and like optimal control setup. Like, I don't think I could state that in like the standard form that we wrote down before. That's kind of a weird integer flavored constraint, right? So like, I don't think you could write that down in the standard form that we sort of started with at the beginning of, of this discussion of deterministic optimal control problems. If you can squeeze it into that form, I would be surprised. So if you want to take that as a challenge uh, and come, come talk to me in office hours, like I'd be, I'd be interested. So yeah, I don't think you can do it at least in that like sort of standard smooth, right? If we had all those like smoothness assumptions about all those functions, I don't think you can write that like integer thing down that way. Yeah, does anybody else have? Yeah. Doesn't the dynamics matter? Like what the dynamics are at that stage? Because uh, in the longer path, you might be at different initial conditions for that particular point compared to other. So what this is saying is like, if I started over and I made XK my initial conditions, where XK is some point on the, the longer trajectory, and I resolved it with that as X naught as the initial condition, the answer has to be this sub trajectory from the bigger trajectory. That's it, right? Think about it as like shortest path or shortest time. You know, these are intuitive things. If there was some shortcut that you could have taken, you would have taken it the first time, right? On the bigger trajectory. Um, okay. Does this hold if your dynamics are kind of stochastic? Uh, yes, although this is like a much more subtle kind of situation <laughs> so so this shortest path thing is like this is specifically the, the cartoon version of this is like for deterministic optimal control problems uh there's sort of you can't quite think about it this way in the stochastic case but um yeah that's probably all there is to say about it in the, in the stochastic case you end up with policies right but I, if you have a time bearing policy i think the, the policy would have to be the same in in like a similar sense okay that makes sense Okay. So let's write this down. Yeah, this seems obvious when, when you say it, but somehow, you know, Richard Bellman made an entire career out of this and got lots of you know, it's got super famous off of this and, you know, I don't know. It's, it's like really interesting to think about this. Like this seems obvious and, and like not that deep, but then like, if you actually like really dig into all the implications of it, it goes really, really deep. And I don't know, you know, so it's so like, I don't know. There's some lesson for life in there somewhere. <laughs> like, okay, cool. Uh, so like said yet another way, we can say sub trajectories of optimal trajectories um, must be optimal for like kind of the appropriately defined subproblem of like the original optimal control problem, right? Okay, cool. So hopefully I belabored that enough and that is now like sunk in your brain. So now we're going to talk about how you actually use this fact to solve control problems. And that is called dynamic programming.
uh, so coined by by Bellman himself. Uh, so basically, kind of like you can kind of see where this is going to go if, if I kind of take this picture again, right? So this whole optimal sub trajectory is having to be optimal thing kind of suggests starting from the end and working your way backwards, right? It's saying like, if I start at the goal state where I know I want to end up, if I go like some tiny amount backwards from the goal, it's kind of obvious what the answer should be. And I can kind of bootstrap from there and kind of work out from the goal because of this optimal sub trajectory idea, right? So this is kind Kind of at the heart of why all of these control things that we've done so far, Pontryagin with the Lagrange multipliers and Riccati with the P's and K's, they all go backwards in time, right? It's kind of coming from this. Okay. So, um, yeah, hints were in. Right. Um, okay, so this is kind of, we, those results kind of just fell out of doing a bunch of math, right? And in the particular case of, well, really, they fell out of kind of boundary conditions, right? Where you know kind of the goal, and that sort of sets you up for having like a boundary condition for the multiplier at the end, it turns out. Um, but there wasn't much more insight than that, right? So this is kind of where the insight into why that should be true comes from. So let's, um, so this will, this is going to sound like I'm just making stuff up. I kind of am. We will, uh, it'll kind of make sense once we've done some more stuff. So I'm just going to dig in. So we're going to define um, a function now called the optimal cost to go, aka uh, value function. And if anyone's done any RL stuff, right, or, or any of this, you've, you've probably heard of this stuff. Okay, um, and we're gonna call this thing V, V of X. Yeah, so in control, it's usually called cost to go or optimal cost to go and in RL context, often called value function. I like cost to go because it makes sense. Value function doesn't mean anything. It's just a random word that carries no, no intuition or meaning, so whatever. Um, so the idea behind this function is that it's going to encode the cost to get from wherever I am to the goal if I act optimally. Does that make sense, everybody? So it's like if I plug in x naught, uh, it's going to you know it's going to tell me what the cost would be to get to the goal from x naught, uh, starting from x naught if I if I act optimally if I if I do the, the optimal thing similarly I can plug in any point I want right like xk somewhere in the middle of the trajectory this function should return the cost from then to the goal assuming I if I do the optimal thing does that make sense cool hence optimal cost to go cost to go to the end from where I am right Oh yeah, this should have a little K on it. Okay, so that's what it is. Um, and because we've talked about so many times LQR being nice and whatever, and kind of this playground for getting nice analytic results, we're gonna look at this thing specifically for LQR right now, and then we'll kind of generalize. So for LQR, this, um, we can easily, once again, bootstrap this at the end. So we know what Vn of x is. It's just the terminal cost, right? 
So Vn of x equals uh, one half x transpose Qn x. And we're gonna call this just like we, well, hint, hint from last time when we did Riccati, we're gonna call Qn Pn. Remember last time we made up these P's and K's out of nowhere. Now it will become obvious what the P's actually are. Okay, so we start at the end. Now we're gonna back up one time step and calculate Vn minus one. Okay, so here's what that looks like. So I'm gonna write down, uh, so I'm acting optimally. So I'm gonna write down an optimization problem over the controls. So min over u of, uh, we're gonna get the one step cost for this time step. So that'll be like xn minus one, q uh, xn minus one, and then the controls. So that's the one step cost at time n minus one. And then I have the cost to go for the rest of the trajectory, which in this case is just Vn. And I want to plug in my dynamics into Vn so that I can write it in terms of just stuff at time step n minus one is the idea. Okay, cool. So now I have a little optimization problem at time step n minus one that um, is only in terms of x at time n minus one and u at time n minus one that will tell me the like sort of the optimal thing to do for the rest of the trajectory here. It's only like one more time step. Um, so we can kind of expand this out um, a little bit and we'll just kind of solve this real quick. So this ends up being you know, over u, same stuff same stuff. I'm going to expand that Vn term. Um, actually, yeah, this will, will be explicit about this since it's, so if I'm minimizing over u, the first term doesn't depend on u, so it drops out, doesn't matter. And then this Vn term ends up looking like, I plug in the dynamics, and it's just Qn or Pn in here, right? Okay, and now thoughts on how I solve this? What do I do? What kind of function is this? Quadratic, so take the derivative, set it equal to zero, life is good. So I'm gonna take the gradient of this thing, um, which will be uh, R, u plus b uh, transpose uh, pn and then a xn minus one plus b u equals zero. And again, what I did here was this is grad u of this thing equals zero to get to that line. And now this equation, I can just massage around and solve for u in terms of uh, x. So I get u n minus one equals minus r n minus one plus, I've been a little bit lazy about the subscripts. Does this look familiar? This is exactly the equation for K that we got last time by looking at the QP. Okay. And um, what do we do now? So like we have the K and if we wanna kind of keep going backwards in time, what I wanna do now is plug this U back into uh, this original equation up here. 
So we'll call this like star. <laughs> and now I want to plug u equals minus k x uh, back into the star equation, the original equation I had, right? And this says vn minus one of x equals one half x transpose two plus k and minus one transpose r k and minus one uh, plus a, I'm gonna like be lazy about subscripts because I don't have enough room, <laughs> sorry. But this works with subscripts. Hopefully this is obvious what I'm doing. Okay, this thing, and if you kind of look at this for a second, it becomes clear that this is a quadratic form in X for the optimal cost to go. The thing in the middle there is the new P at time step N minus one. So basically what this says is, right, the cost to go, if I started out as quadratic and I do this kind of thing, right? As I move back, the cost to go stays quadratic. And I can always write it in that standard form as like X transpose PX. And this is our p n minus one, and so now we have you know sort of v n minus one of x equals one half x transpose p n minus one x, and we have the recipe now for a backward recursion in k and p just like before. And unsurprisingly, this is just the Riccati equation again, but like kind of derived in a new way from a new perspective. The equation for K is exactly the same as what we had yesterday. The equation for P is a little bit different. Turns out you can write the P equation in a handful of different ways and massage it to look a little bit different. The version yesterday uh, was, was a little different flavor. In particular, the version yesterday was not symmetric the way it was written. And this version is symmetric the way it's written. It turns out this one is better numerically because it's explicitly written symmetrically like this and P is supposed to be a symmetric matrix. So it turns out if you're doing this on a computer, this, this way behaves better with respect to like numerical round off and stuff like that. So do this one, but um, they're mathematically equivalent in like, you know, infinite precision arithmetic or whatever. Um, cool. Okay, so any questions about this? Yeah. Dude, can you go over again like where that whole P N minus one comes from, or like well, how does it plug into a? How does plugging it into the original? Okay, yeah. So I have up here. Um, this is the definition. I should write this maybe a little bit clearer. So this guy up here is um, the first line of this is like me backing up a step and writing down what like the cost, the optimal cost should be from time step n minus one, right? I'm basically solving a one step optimal control problem. So that's, this thing is vn minus one up here, right? That's sort of the definition. And I, what I did then is I just went through and solved that optimization problem. And like, what I get out of it is I get u equals minus kx. And then once I have u equals minus kx, I can plug it into this star equation to eliminate u and get it to just be a function of x. And now that it's just a function of X, I have VN minus one of X, right? I want to write it as just a function of the state. Does that make sense? So the game is I write down the optimal control problem for one step, which depends on X and U. I solve it for U as a function of X to get the feedback law. Then I plug the feedback law back in to get rid of the U's. And now I have just a function of X. And I just recursively go backward in time doing that. And I get this cost to go and I get the feedback law. 
You're kind also of, plugging in like the one for the VN, right? So the VN one I just made up, right? That's just the terminal cost. So I always know VN. It's just the given terminal cost from the problem definition. And in the case of LQR, it's this last term where we have X transpose QNX. So in LQR, the, the terminal cost is just that. So I, that, you know, you start there. Then if you back up one step, you plug in the one step cost of time n minus one, and then the dynamics, and then, you know, the terminal, whatever, and you get this thing, you solve it for one step. And you know, that's the recipe. Now I've bootstrapped it. So this, you know, now I have Vn minus one as X transpose Pn minus, it looks exactly the same, right? So now I have a recursion, I can keep doing it backwards and it keeps looking the same and I can cache all that stuff on my back and get the gains and the whole thing. It's just the stuff we did yesterday. Yesterday we looked at it as like this sparse matrix trick. Here is a little more insight into like why that should happen. And like there's structure there because of the time, you know, arrow of time causality kind of thing. And really like, this is really the, the deep reason why the matrix structure that we had last time is a result of this like deeper facts about, you know, what's going on. Cool. All right. So let's do like the general case now. Okay, so generally speaking, for like arbitrary optimal control problems, what you can do is you can always start with Vn of x equals, or we're gonna sort of use this. This is your terminal cost. So ln of x, like we wrote down when we first defined this optimal control problem. Um, and then we're gonna do, um, sort of like for, little k time step um, from like uh, n to one or whatever in, in Julia notation. Uh, or maybe I'll write this a different way. Let's write this like a clearer way. We'll write little k gets uh, n and then while, oops. While k is greater than one, we're gonna do v uh, k minus one of x equals min over u of the one step cost so L of x u plus the optimal cost to go for the next time step, which carries the cost all the way to the rest of the trajectory, right? So v k of and we plug the dynamics in there. So it's all at the current time step. And then uh, we do, you know, K equals K minus one. And we do, we just do that. So we start at the end with the terminal cost. We go back a time step, solve the one step problem where we plug in, you know, the dynamics, discrete dynamics into that cost function. Um, and then we can work our way backwards computing this optimal cost to go thing. All the way to the beginning once we've done that we've got the cost to go for the whole thing then we can get the feedback policy from that optimal cost to go um, which we kind of did all together before for lqr but um we can say if we know we know this cost to go thing that's basically just as good as having the feedback policy it turns out that like basically has everything you need um the optimal policy is uk of x is arg min over u l of x u plus this one x u. Basically, if you give me the optimal cost to go, then online, I can actually just solve this little optimization problem for you. So I plug in the X there. Now it's just a function of U. And I just minimize that with respect to U and I get the optimal U, right? So this is a, a feedback policy now, right? That makes sense to everybody? So op optimal cost to go basically encodes the entire solution to the control problem and is essentially just as good as having the feedback policy. Okay, so what else is there to say about this? 
I think we should maybe go do some stuff code-wise at this point. Uh, is this basically what RL people call like the value iteration algorithm? You just swap like the max and then it's yeah. Really so value iteration is uh, is basically this, but it's um, value iteration is sort of a technique for solving the min inside this backward Riccati equation, where you're solving for a value function that's like parameterized some way. Either you grid right, or you use a function approximator for v. Yeah. And it's so it, yeah, evaluation is specifically uh, optimizing the the function v over like the parameters, you know, the neural net weights or the whatever, right? So it's doing like essentially like gradient descent on the v's in this setup. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a specific algorithm for for computing this. Yeah. Yep. This is making assumptions that you can apply apply infinite controls to get whatever optimal x is or whatever x optimal the next v. So not. So in the LQR case, yes, um, but not in general, actually, because when I do this min, I can actually put constraints on that. So I mean, another, I can write this as min for like, to handle that, I can do this, like min over u in the feasible, you know, u set, right? So I can constrain the u's when I solve that problem. And if you're using this in a stochastic environment, then you don't necessarily know that your next x would be reachable from your previous x given your control. Yeah, so in the stochastic case, things get a little weirder. Uh, we're going to talk about that later in the class. But yeah, so this generalizes to the stochastic setting. Essentially, you put expectation operators around everything in here, and it still works. But yeah, a bunch of weirder things happen, and it gets a lot more complicated. So we're going to punt on that for like another I don't know, month and a half. Uh, OK, uh, anybody else? OK, so let's see. Where are we in here? Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit uh, before we go do code things. Actually, there's some more things to say. So um, the next kind of like very obvious thing. So a bunch of you've seen RL stuff before. It sounds like. So um, what do we typically do in in RL land when we when we do this stuff? Uh, we don't typically. Well, a lot of the times you don't deal with the value function directly or the cost to go. You define this other thing that's typically called the Q function or the action value function. So we, let's write that real quick. So this, we're going to not use the letter Q because that's in LQR already. So I'm going to call it S, I don't know, just because. So the action value function is just um, the one step cost plus the uh, cost to go thing. So L, X, U plus V, K plus one, F of X, U. So it's literally the thing inside the min in the, in the Bellman backward dynamic programming equation thing, right? So why would I want to do this? Does anyone, well, so, and then this thing, right? just means that the Bellman recursion now is just this guy. Okay, so why would I do this instead of, why would I do everything in terms of this Q function, action value function, S here, instead of the value function in RL? Why do you think we'd want to do this? Yeah. Nope. Um, it doesn't make, in fact, Q has a bigger dimension, right? Q has both the X's and the U's as arguments. It's actually over a larger space, right? So the answer is what's inside the argument of V inside this thing? in the standard recursion. Like when I do the standard thing, when I go backwards, I have to plug the dynamics into V, right? So I need to know the dynamics. I need a dynamics model to do it in terms of value functions. If I'm doing like model free stuff where I don't know the model, um, this thing lets me get the same behavior and, and like kind of solve the problem, never needing to know F explicitly. So essentially like this thing, uh, it, it like implicitly buries the dynamics inside the action value function, right? They're kind of stuffed into the value function there. So this thing gets you 
kind of like effectively both the dynamics and the value function kind of all together in a single function. So you don't need a dynamics model. That, that is why. Isn't there a second reason also, which is that you can use this as an off policy updater? Like you don't need to kind of have the full trajectory. Um, you can, I think you can kind of still do off policy ish things with value functions though. Um, yeah, but I think it's usually like a lot harder. Like well, it's only that you just need the, really, it's just, you need the dynamics, right? Like if I have the dynamics, then, then like the value function is just as good, right. As, a, as the Q function, like they're the same thing. Right. So I, I, I think it's really just this. Um, yeah, I guess that's fair. Okay, so some notes. This is usually called this. Um, okay, and um, okay, so that's cool. Okay, questions? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not quite seeing this, like, like how this doesn't have the same thing. So, so yeah, so what I'm saying is right now I'm doing that, right? When I have the value function, I need the dynamics to plug in to go backwards. If I define this function s to be equal to that, and I rewrite this backward thing in terms of s, I'm just doing min over u of s instead of now, right? So there's no f in there. I can do the whole backward recursion in terms of this s without ever needing the, the f. Does that make sense? So how do you do that? Uh, you start with a terminal cost. And then you like, this is if you're doing like experiments. So you can do this in a ex purely experimental, like data driven, you know, way where I just run a bunch of experiments on something and like get a bunch of data and then try to fit this function from data. And I can do that directly on the S without needing the dynamics. Um, there's lots more to say about this, I guess, but, uh, you know, that's the idea at least in practice, it doesn't work out that way super well a lot of the time. Okay. So last, before we kind of like finish this discussion up, I guess, um, let's talk about the curse. Also coined by Bellman himself. Okay. So, um, let's see, there's a bunch of nice things about this, right? So, um, DP, this dynamic programming thing is uh, a sufficient condition for a global optimum. So even on like horrible nonlinear problems, if I can do the DP thing, if I can do this dynamic programming thing and get the solution, that is the optimal solution. Whereas with the trajectory optimization stuff we talked about, that's only gonna find us a local minimum, right? So that's pretty awesome. Let's see, what else? Um, okay, so why wouldn't we just do this all the time? Thoughts? Why is this hard? Why didn't we just talk about this if this is the amazing, like solves everything globally answer? What's well, wrong? Thing, uh, that here, like you need to kind of, well, at least the way you've set it up, it's like kind of tabular, like in a continuous case, you wouldn't really be able to do this nicely. Like it would just blow up. Yeah, what's gonna blow up? Like your memory, basically. Yeah, so the problem comes down to how do I write down the value function itself or the action value function, that function. Um, in general, this is a horrible, you know, gross, nonlinear, high dimensional function, right? It's, it's in the state space. So if I have a humanoid robot, that could be like 80 dimensional state space. And it's some random function defined in 80 dimensions. If it's not like linear or quadratic, I don't know how to write that thing down. Right? Like, what is it? It's some huge thing. Um, the like sort of brute force thing to do would be to like grid the 80 dimensional state space and try to like solve this over a grid and come up with values in all the little grid boxes. But in general, that's like, that scales horribly with the state dimension, right? And um, in general, there's no good way of writing this V down. Once you get past LQR, where it's a nice quadratic, if it's some general arbitrary function, I just can't write it down in any nice closed form way. And therefore, I can't do this backward recursion thing in any nice way. Okay, so let's sort of like comments are welcome, thoughts are welcome on this while I write. 
So really like true dynamic programming like this, exact dynamic programming is really only tractable for super simple problems. Um, LQR, we can do it in arbitrary dimensions, really. Like you can scale LQR up to like a thousand plus dimensions if you want to, um, or kind of like nonlinear low dimensional problems where you can actually somehow write down the V in a, in a way, you know, that's like close to exact. Okay, so that's sort of only things we can do exactly, right? So in the LQR case, V of X stays quadratic. But if you have, um, even if you have a nice quadratic cost, if the dynamics are nonlinear, when I like compose the nonlinear dynamics with V, like I have to do in this backward pass, it becomes super gross. And you can imagine as I do that recursively, as I go back, it gets worse and worse and worse. And there's basically no hope. Okay, so doo -doo 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 -doo. so one other thing. Okay, so let's say I had a magic uh, way of representing this gross high dimensional nonlinear function. And I had like the V or the S. Uh, there's one other problem with this. If I have that thing in general, right? In the general case, it's some horrible, really complicated nonlinear function, non-convex function. And solving the min over U of that thing in the to, to get the feedback policy is now a big nasty non-convex optimization problem, right? So even that's not nice anymore. So min over u of like s uh, x u. Okay, um, yeah, and basically, as many of you probably heard, right, the, the, the curse thing here is called the curse of dimensionality is the original like Bellman thing. And basically what it says is the cost of doing dynamic programming blows up with the state dimension due to the difficulty of representing V, of writing V down in any sane way. Um, Uh, okay, so so I we just spent all this time on this, and I just told you it's like basically practically useless. So why do we care? Why do we care about this? So you've obviously you've all heard of this, right? So like where. Where have you heard about this? And like, where, like, what is the, I don't know, there's a happier side to this story than I just told you, right? So what is the happier side of this for those who, who know some stuff about this? Yeah, so we can do approximate dynamic programming where you basically use any function approximator you want for the V or the S. And that's basically all of reinforcement learning. Um, I should say that. And the other reason we care about this is, as as was alluded to before, this 
generalizes to the stochastic optimal control problem, stochastic setting, whereas the Pontryagin stuff does not. And we're going to talk about this more later in the class. But essentially, the recipe is you just wrap everything in expectations. And then, yeah, the kind of Pontryagin does not generalize. OK, let's see. OK, one last little thing before we look at code and like call it a day. Finally, what are the Lagrange multipliers from the QP and from like the original Pontryagin thing? This was like the, this was asked, I think multiple times. Any ideas? This is why I have to wait till now to talk about this. Anyone know? Anyone have any thoughts? Okay, we'll write it down then. Okay, so, so from the Riccati derivation from the QP, we had, remember, lambda k equals pkxk. And then we also had this, the recursion on P from that. Um, so this we had from before. And from today, we have, you know, this cost to go definition. So looking at this, what are the lambdas? Uh -huh. They're the gradient of the cost to go. So it's sort of obvious in this LQR case. Um, turns out this is true in general for arbitrary sort of nonlinear problems. So the Lagrange multipliers of the dynamics constraints turn out to be the gradient of the cost to go function. This is not at all obvious. You know, you have to think about this one for a while. It's kind of interesting. And then this it turns out this carries over. Not just LQR. Okay. Any questions about that? That one you might have to chew on a little bit, but uh, it's kind of cool and kind of a deep result. So like kind of implicitly, right? Like this is saying, you can think about the, like we talked about Lagrange multipliers, it's kind of the force holding you on the constraint, right? Another way to think about them is like um, the marginal like cost, you know, benefit you could have if you were allowed to violate the constraints. So this is kind of saying like, if I were allowed to, violate the dynamics, like violate physics at some point on the trajectory a little bit, the Lagrange multiplier tells you how much lower the cost could get for a small, you know, violation of the physics there or whatever, which is kind of interesting. I don't know. There's, there's sort of like some interesting depth to that. Okay, so now it's time to do code example things. So you guys have questions about stuff? Okay, so this is back to our super tiny little LQR problem that we've talked about a whole bunch now. Uh, the double integrator, same stuff as before. Um, oh, this is the controllability matrix thing. This thing's two by two. So the controllability matrix here is just B then AB, right? And I can check the rank of that thing and it's two and that matches the state dimension. So I know that I'm controllable, so that's cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and sort of like write down the same problem we've been doing all along. So same cost stuff, 
10 second time horizon, 10 Hertz, start at one zero, same cost matrices, same cost function. Um, this we'll use later. So these are cost to go functions that I'm defining based on our discussion, right? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and find the QP solution like we did before. So we build the giant H and C matrices and solve this big QP thing by solving that giant linear system like last time. And now I'm gonna do it using dynamic programming. So here's, uh, you know, we start at the end with the terminal uh, cost to go Hessian guy there. And then we go ahead and run these Riccati things backwards. This is exactly what we just wrote down. Um, so I'm going to do the backwards thing and then the forward rollout thing like last time. But now, you know, we derived this a different way. The P equation is a little different, but it turns out it's mathematically equivalent. I'm going to plot everything. So the QP solution against the sort of dynamic programming solution, they're the same. No surprises there. Uh, what else? So the controls, controls are all the same, blah, blah, blah. That's not super interesting. Okay, let's look at some interesting things. So last time we looked at the K matrices converging backward in time, right? So unsurprisingly for that to work out, the P matrix also has to converge backward in time. So P here is N by N in the state dimension. And so it's two by two for this problem, right? And it's symmetric and positive definite. It's a Hessian, right? And all this other good stuff. So here I'm just plotting the three unique elements because the off diagonal ones are the same. So you can see these converge pretty fast as I go backward. And like we said, um, oh, here's the cost, whatever. Okay, so I'm gonna compute the infinite horizon K matrix like we did last time. I'll show you those match, what I got here at the kind of at this end. And then similarly, so that's DLQR. We talked about that last time. I can compute the infinite horizon P matrix also using this DARE. That stands for discrete algebraic Riccati equation. So this will give me the P. I can compare that to my P here. Um, and you know, it agrees to like nine decimal places, whatever. If I took this out even further, it would get get better and basically get to machine precision. Um, you shouldn't probably compute the Riccati super far out. It's, it's like inefficient to do it that way. Instead, you should use these guys, which do the super efficient, you know, kind of smart things uh, to solve that for the infinite horizon thing. So this is fun. Let's go do the, um, we're gonna now do that like Bellman principle optimal sub trajectory thing. So I'm gonna do a forward rollout with the feedback law starting from some random XK in the middle of the trajectory. Uh, so we'll start at t equals we'll, like k equals 50 and roll it out from there just to show you that like these things match. So like I, I take that chunk out of the original trajectory and show you it obviously kind of matches, right? Uh, cool, use match two. That shouldn't be a surprise. Okay, now let's do some fun stuff. So we're going to take the Lagrange multipliers out of the QP and we're going to compare them to the cost to grow, cost to go gradients. So this is what we get from the QP from actually pulling the lambdas out of that giant QP um, at this time step, I guess. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write down, I wrote down that cost to go function up above. I'm gonna actually use auto diffing to get the gradient of the cost to go function. And uh, as you can see, these things match pretty far out. They're almost the same thing, almost exact. Um, another thing I can do, I can compute the finite, the infinite horizon value using that discrete algebraic Riccati equation guy. And that also matches you know, pretty well. Okay. Oh yeah, this is kind of fun. We could finite diff this. So what I'm going to do here is uh, finite diff the cost uh, function with respect to the state um, at like a given time step. And as you can see, this yet again does does kind of the thing you expect. So at some random state, right? I'm computing this if I tweak the cost, the the initial state a little bit at the and then like do a rollout and compute the total cost, right? That cost to go. This shows you kind of that's what that lambda is, right? It's the sort of small sensitivity in the state of the total cost if I act optimally, right? Okay, cool. So this is, I don't know, hopefully this is interesting. Anyone have anything they want me to try? Any questions about this? Thoughts, comments? Nothing? Okay, yeah. Is the fact that the Lagrange um, multipliers happen to be the same leverage that passed for anything? Or is it no, 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 no. This applies in general. You can do lots of cool things with that. Uh, so we're, we'll talk some more about this. So in particular, um, local approximations to the cost to go are valuable in, in lots and lots of ways. Yeah. So 
for example, right, if you want to like uh, train a function approximator to to like you know uh, approximate the value function, if I have lots of if I have a trajectory optimizer, I can go solve lots of trajectory optimization problems, and from that I get the cost to go right along the whole trajectory. I also get the cost to go gradients for free basically. And I can use all of that to train a function approximator, right? I can train on not only the values, but also the gradients. Um, there's, there's many other use cases we will get into next time. There's, there's like one particular really good use case for like this sort of like gradient Hessian information about the cost to go. Like a lot of these methods, you can get a local Taylor approximation for the cost to go. And that turns out to be super useful for a lot of things. So we'll, we'll talk more next time. What's the drawback there? Why isn't it used right now? Uh, because people don't know how <laughs> we're, we're doing stuff like this in, in, in deep RL. So there are, there are a few reasons. Um, one is that like training on the gradients is a little subtle. Um, and the other is people in RL don't know how to do this stuff <laughs> is, is honestly my honest answer to that. Like most of them don't know how to do legit, like trajectory optimization stuff. And like Newton's method is not a thing in RL. Right. So people just often don't know about this stuff. Um, yeah, we're doing it. Some people do it. <laughs> so unsurprisingly, right, if you actually leverage these gradients, you can train a lot faster. Um, right. So so yeah, there there are people who've done things like this, but it's not it's not the norm. Um, another reason is this requires some model information, right, and all this stuff. And a lot of people are into model free stuff, and that's a whole other story. Uh, yeah, more to say about this. Happy to talk about this. You know. Happy to vent about the current state of deep reinforcement learning anytime. Yeah. Um, so when we are actually using these gradients, So what you just said, the second part of that, that's called receding horizon or, or model predictive control, which we're going to talk about, start talking about next lecture. So people do both things. People do whatever, essentially like it all depends on how much compute you have, right? And like how, how big the problem is and how fast you can solve. If you can solve the problem super fast online, then you can kind of do some really interesting things. If you can't, then you end up trying to like make approximations, shorter horizons, all these things, right? To be able to solve the problems fast enough. So there's a huge range there. And we'll, we'll, we're gonna get into this a bunch yeah, next time. All right, anybody else? You guys are welcome to leave, obviously. It's, it's, it's time, but yeah, if you want to hang out and, and chat more about controls, whatever, I'm happy to. Anybody else?